the assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Gaston Alfonso Brown, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance and Corporate Governance of Antigua and Barbuda. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency. I have great pleasure in welcoming the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance and Corporate Governance of Antigua and Barbuda, and I invite him to address the General Assembly. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I will surprise no one that climate change and its catastrophic consequences are foremost on my mind. As a leader of a small island state that two years later is still suffering the damaging consequences of Hurricane Irma, we know and live the terrible reality of climate change. Those who continue to deny its existence cannot gainsay the massive destruction to property and loss of life that so glaringly stare them in the face year after year. No one can repudiate the awful scenes flashed globally across television screens and social media of the decimation of the Abaco Islands and Grand Bahama in the Bahamas island chain. The lament of the people of the Bahamas as the entire nation suffered in hopelessness, should echo in the ears of all who feel any compassion for their fellow man. The consequences of climate change have become our annual Hiroshima. The effects are as horrific as any battleground and as devastating and long-lasting as an atomic bomb. But in this war that we did not start, that we do not wage and that we do not want, the peoples of small island states have no means to defend themselves and little means to recover. We are simply the hapless victims of those governments whose destructive climate policies are killing small island states with brutal storm after brutal storm, each more destructive than the last. The economies of Caribbean small island states are rooted in tourism and agriculture, which are very dependent on stable climatic conditions. Already, these activities are being persistently disrupted, losing revenues to our countries and incurring large recurring debt to finance both reconstruction and resilience building. With few exceptions, Pledges of assistance, when they have been made, are inadequate and slow in delivery, if delivered at all. Mr. President, despite all the targets set by climate change conferences to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, every nation on this earth and all the people within them should understand that even if that small level of ambition is achieved, that these climate effects will continue for at least 1,000 years. That's right, 1,000 years. This assembly should take urgent and special note of the IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming and the recent report on oceans. In small island states, we have come to the painful conclusion that 30 or more generations of our people will year after year suffer from conditions already created by harmful greenhouse gas emissions of a handful of countries. We also know that if this profligate behavior does not stop, many of our island states will not last for a thousand years. We also fear that the necessary action to halt greenhouse gas emissions 
might only come when a few countries and coastal communities are entirely washed away and eliminated from the face of the global map. And even then, after a ritual ringing of hands and pledges to act and to stop the obliteration of small island states, business may well continue as usual. That is a sad reality. That, of course, is not a prospect that the people and governments of small states will contemplate for a second. That is why this is preeminently a time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly in this assembly without fear or favor. The very existence of our small island states and our civilization are imperiled. However, we will not sit by idly in silence. Action is imperative, and we certainly will act now. Mr. President, here we are at the 30th anniversary of the convention. The mockery of the convention, which asserts that the importance of improving the living conditions of children in every community is important, especially in developing countries. The prospects for the world's children are impaired, and they are being robbed of a bright and prosperous future. That's right, we are robbing our youth of a bright and prosperous future. I congratulate Greta Thunberg and all the children she motivated globally including those in my own country. In fact, I congratulate all those who acted in solidarity on September 20th to warn our governments to take bold action against climate change. I remind this August body that they are watching, and governments that choose to turn a deaf ear to the young will surely pay a price. Mr. President, the protection of fossil fuel economic interests at the expense of climate justice is unfair, unjust, and unconscionable. If governments have lost their moral compass in a, in a world where multilateralism and common interests are being discarded, we must hope, Mr. President, that governments nonetheless realize that global cooperation is still required to preserve national interests. We should remind ourselves of the wisdom of John Donne's devotions. And I quote, no man is an island enti entirely of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main, end of quote. And whether they like it or not, the refugees from the countries that are decimated by hurricanes will wash up on their shores. It is inescapable. The internally displaced persons that were created by hurricanes in 2017 and already in 2019 were cared for mostly within their own national boundaries. But there were others that had to seek refuge elsewhere refuge that was not provided within a legal and predictable framework. But from a spirit of generosity and by the compassion of other nations, Mr. President, this is not an acceptable basis for going forward. With the best will in the world, generosity is constrained by capacity and compassion is tempered by reality. This assembly should recognize that the UN High Commission for Refugees, which operates under the 1951 Refugee Convention, contemplates refugees only in the context of conflict and or political upheaval. However, the number of refugees already created by climate change and the potential for greater numbers in the future demand that the legal rec recognition of a refugee includes persons forced to seek refuge outside of their national borders. In this connection, my government proposes that member states agree at this assembly that the matter of climate refugees be taken up in all the appropriate committees to secure, 
to secure an agreed definition of the term climate refugees. That would and could be adopted in international law where it does not now exist. My government is per perfectly aware that this proposal will be resisted by the governments that deny climate change and are fearful of acknowledging its consequences. Nonetheless, we will put it forward, seeking support from the countries that are similarly threatened and from the states that recognize the potential threats and will act to protect lives and to safeguard order. But if this matter is left on a jest by this United Nations, then it will certainly carry the indelible stain of guilt for the catastrophe that will befall us because they fail to act and to establish a global framework to manage cross-border climate refugees. Mr. President, I invoke in this hall, in the presence of high representatives of the world's peoples, the words of U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the time of crisis in 1933. He said, and I quote, in the field of world policy, I would dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself, and because he does so, respects the rights of others, the neighbor who respects his obligations and respects the sanctity of his agreements in and with a world of neighbors." End of quote. Mr. President, there was only one common homeland and one human race. There's no planet B or any viable alternative planet on which to live. The worst and immediate victims of climate change are small island states where a history of human exploitation and neglect has left significant numbers of our population poor and without resources to build climate resilient infrastructure and homes. That is our inheritance. But eventually, Climate change will make victims of people who live in the large masses too, and not only their coastal areas, but their hinterland as well. That process has started already on every continent and across every border. The only solution to the harmful effects of climate change is to stop the greenhouse gas emissions. There's no other choice. And that is what the heavy users of fossil fuels must do. They must lead by example to achieve a carbon neutral world. Roosevelt's summons to every nation to be a good neighbor is more relevant now than it was 86 years ago. In Antigua and Barbuda, we are playing our part. My government has banned the importation of single use plastics and is actively transforming our marine environment into a plastic-free one. Also, we are actively transitioning into alternate energy with intended nationally determined contributions that will make our country carbon neutral by 2040. Earlier this year, we were pleased to host an international concert, the Plate Out Concert, in collaboration with the government of Norway and the former president of the UN General Assembly, Maria Fernando Espinosa, to heighten global awareness of the harmful effects of plastics on our oceans. Antigua and Barbuda is standing up to be counted among those countries that is doing and will continue to do all in its power to curb pollution in all its aspects, in every aspect. Mr. President, there is a notion abroad that developing countries, especially small ones, operate on a premise of blaming rich and powerful nations for their problems of underdevelopment and a lack of capacity to produce and compete. And consequently, we live in a state of paralysis waiting for aid. That notion is extremely flawed. It is very different from reality. Our small nations are not beggars. We are not mendicants. But where there is injustice, we must fight for justice. Where there is inequity, we must fight for equity. Whereas most countries have access to cheap funding under capital markets, 
Needy small island states have had to borrow at commercial rates to fund their development. Where is the justice in that? And that is why we have to fight for change. That is why we have to fight for equity. What we want is access to financing on fair and concessionary terms commensurate with our size and vulnerabilities. And that is not too much to ask. We have a proud history of seizing the reins of our independence and sovereignty against all odds. And we have done so to develop our countries rapidly after centuries of colonial or hegemonistic exploitation. But we know that our own development and financial vulnerability were created by centuries of exploitation in slavery, bound labor for which no compensation was paid. That is why Caribbean countries in all sectors, driven by non-governmental organizations, have urged relevant European governments to repair the debilitating socioeconomic conditions, the destruction of resources, the dehumanization and genocide of Caribbean people resulting from the slave trade, slavery, and the ravages of colonialism. It is why I take the opportunity of this assembly to do so again. The relevant European nations should provide reparations, not only because, at last, it would compensate for the development in the backs of our people, but because it is the morally correct thing to do to restore equity and justice. And we should be clear, reparation is not aid. It is not a gift. It is compensation to correct the injustices of the past and to restore equity. That is what we want. We want equity. Similarly, Mr. President, the provision of finance to support mitigation, adaptation, and resilience in small states, such as Antigua and Barbuda, that is not aid. It is compensation for the damage done to our countries, for the reversals in our economic gains, and for the additional money we must spend to counter further injurious effects of climate change in which we play a little part. Mr. President, my country and others in the Caribbean are intent on promoting economic growth, social development, and resilience by internal action. And we'll do so even as we expect developed countries to meet the obligations. So we are not depending on them, on them exclusively. But it seems that every time we achieve a high level of competitiveness with rich regions of the world, they impose arbitrary measures to undermine and shackle us. That's right. In the financial services sector, anti-competitive actions have been forced on us by the European Union in the area of taxation. And they have done so despite the fact that our countries have been compliant with standards set by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Further, despite our vulnerabilities as remote islands, confronted with high interest and in insurance costs, unsustainable debt, and frequent disasters arising from climate change, we are disqualified from access to concessional financing based on a single criterion, the per capita income criterion. Now, that cannot be fair. That cannot be just. Today, we reiterate our call for the removal of the per capita income criterion, which precludes vulnerable small island states from accessing much-needed concessional funding. Also, Climate funding to adapt, mitigate, and build resistance should not be subject to any conditionality, but based exclusively on vulnerability and need. That is what is equitable. Mr. President, another injustice confronting the Caribbean is the phenomenon of the withdrawal of corresponding banking relations or financial abandonment. Financial abandonment by banks in the US and some parts of Europe from our region. This is based primarily on profit motives and the, the false allegations that our countries are major money launderers and tax havens. And that is not so. 
Now, both the Financial Action Task Force and the Global Forum of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development have assessed and found most of our countries to be fully compliant with rigorous international standards. Yet, the process of withdrawing corresponding banking relations continues un unabated, threatening to exclude Caribbean countries from international payment system, debanking our nations with the potential of plunging all of our countries into poverty. Again, that is an inequitable position. And let me make the point here that corresponding banking is a public global good, a fundamental human right, and must be available to all countries and regions. <laughs> Unless this process is stopped in reverse, it is not only Caribbean countries that will suffer, but so too will the developed countries in which global banks are located. For the Caribbean's exclusion from the world's trading system and the resultant economic collapse will create poverty, unemployment, crime including drug trafficking, on the ground money laundering, refugees, all of which will challenge the security of the wealthy neighboring states in this hemisphere. Now, if these countries will not act in our interests, they certainly should act in their own interests. The fire in our house, which we did not start, will inevitably spread to theirs. The time to extinguish it is now. Mr. President, our small island states could be forgiven for their belief that the cards are being deliberately stacked against them. No evidence is available to contend otherwise. <clears throat> In this connection, my government is obliged once again to draw to the attention of this assembly that 15 years ago, my country won an arbitration against the United States, the most powerful country in the world. This was won at the World Trade Organization. The matter was appealed twice. And twice, the arbitral award was given in Antigua and Barbuda's favor. The final award was made 12 years ago. Can you imagine that? 12 years ago. The World Trade Organization gave my country the right to sell US copyright material on an annual basis. And they did so in order to help us to recover the full cost of our trade losses. However, we decided not to do so, but to negotiate with the U.S. government since the former would deprive U.S. copyright holders of deserved income from their intellectual property through no fault of theirs. And we thought we were doing the sensible thing. But advantage has been taken of our forbearance and our magnanimity. Now, despite the ruling of the WTO, my small country has not been able to bring the representatives of the United States to the table to settle this arbitration award. This is a typical example where might is right. And to whom much is given, much is expected. The arbitral award due to us has been ignored, while the perennial trade surplus that the United States enjoys with my little country has exceeded 3.53 billion United States dollars during the last 12 years. This too is unfair, it's unjust, it's unconscionable. How many times have we have to come here to the United Nations and to ask the United States to settle? We want justice. <laughs> Once again, we urge the United States to respect the decision of the WTO and to settle its obligations soon as 12 years is too long. And let me make it abundantly clear that our country cannot forego legally awarded recompense to the trade losses we have suffered by U.S. action. And we will not. And we are not afraid of your might. We are standing on principle. In fact, let me make it clear that we too have a duty of care to our people. So just as how you are protecting your interests, we must also protect our national interests. 
And the last time I checked, we live in a democratic world. So those who want to take punitive action against us, speaking out for right, they can do so. But we will stand in any forum and defend the interests of Antigua and Barbuda. <laughs> Mr. President, my government is deeply concerned about the trade contention between the United States and the People's Republic of China. Trade wars invariably push up the cost of living for peoples across the world, especially the poor and vulnerable. And ultimately, they cause the entire global economy to suffer. There are no winners in this. And we are already in that spiral. Confrontation instead of dialogue and cooperation is exacerbating the risk, eroding confidence, and weakening the prospect of global economic growth. There will be no winners if this continues, only losers. Unfortunately, among the hardest hit will be small island developing states with their open and vulnerable economies. So there we go again, suffering from the injustices of the mighty. The international system, which has never been perfect, is now being dangerously weakened. A handful of powerful nations are seeking to violate international norms and the rule of law to advance narrow political agendas concerned more with getting rid of governments that they dislike than in advancing human rights under whose guise they seek to cover. And we are not stupid. We know exactly what you are doing, and we are watching you. <laughs> Only this week, 16 countries, a few of them, perhaps coerced into participation, maybe by threats or promises, invoke the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance as a weapon against the sovereign nation of Venezuela. The treaty is a 72-year-old anachronism that encourages the use of force against a sovereign state, contrary to international law, and not within the concept of the legitimate defense set out in Article 51 of our UN Charter. Without producing a shed of evidence to support the allegations, these 16 nations have arbitrarily decided to impose sanctions against Venezuela with the sole intention of regime change. And they're doing so against all of the international standards In fact, we all know the United Nations standards call for non-interference and non-intervention in the affairs of other states. In fact, significantly, we should note that the International Contact Group, the ICG, on Venezuela, at a meeting on the same day, reaffirmed that only sustainable solution to the Venezuelan crisis is a political, peaceful, and democratic one, excluding the use of force and through credible and transparent credit, uh, presidential elections. Now, this position is sensible and is in keeping with international law. Mr. President, my government protests the arrogance inherent in the belief of 16 countries that they have the right to decide for the rest of the world. How could they? That they can ignore this United Nations, that they can be contemptuous of the Security Council, and that they can act to harm a country on a spurious charge of drug trafficking, money laundering, and organized crime. This action follows the same formula, the same formula that has destabilized Cuba, robbing that country of fulfilling its considerable poten potential in contributing fully to global advancement, peace, and security. Why we can't live in peace and harmony? Why can't we resolve our conflicts through diplomacy and dialogue? My government once again calls on the United States to lift the debilitating sanctions against Cuba and those against Venezuela. You're killing innocent people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are also troubled by events in the Middle East and the overall heightening of tensions in the world. 
in which multilateral solutions have been discarded in favor of unilateral action and even the contemplation of war. The world is not the OK Corral, and a gunfight should not decide who wins and who loses. My government calls on all governments to return to the rules-based system of international relations, which was meticulously established to settle disputes and resolve conflicts. The rules are there to protect all of us. A world of prosperity will not be sustained without global cooperation, global peace, and global justice. In this context, I recall the words of Nelson Mandela, who knew much about working with the enemy, real, perceived, or created. He said, and I quote, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. Then he becomes your partner, end of quote. Mr. President, the world needs partners, not enemies. Our planet and our peoples depend on it. I thank you very much, Mr. President. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance and Corporate Governance of Antigua and Barbuda for the statement just made. And I request protocol to escort His Excellency.